Hey there friends, Dave Politis, Kenny, I'm Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. And this is a Missing Persons edition for the Canaan Missing Project. A lot of questions lately. The Canaan Missing Project is the overriding name for our organization. And our website, canammissing.com, is the website for missing people. Now we also have a website, and I've owned it for 15 years called NA, like North America Bigfoot Search.com, and that is where our online store is at. It has no relationship to the missing people, it just happens to be where our store is at. Now, at our store, you can buy the DVD for Missing 411 The UFO Connection, and <clears throat> for the first movie we did, Missing 411, you can buy the first DVD for that. Now, if you want to watch the movie online, that's where you go. Freeze frame this or pause it and write it down, but that's where you can watch the movie online, iTunes, Amazon, Vimeo, etc. They're all right there. But if you want a DVD or Blu-ray, you buy it from us. And I've been talking to you lately about a couple of my uh, appearances in the coming year. Big one, uh, January 12th just outside of Denver at Golden, Colorado. I'll be presenting that movie in an auditorium and we'll be taking Q&A afterwards. And that is being done by the Sasquatch Outpost. And there are still seats available because we only put this up about two weeks ago, so uh, not everyone's heard about it. But if you go to the Sasquatch Outpost, you go to the events section, get your tickets. It's gonna be a great night. And lastly, in September of 2023, if you Google Alaska Bigfoot Cruise, uh, I'm going to be on that cruise, have dinner together. Uh, I'm going to go fishing while I'm on this cruise on a couple of ports, and we're going to take some people with us. So I uh, want to spend the day together and talk about Bigfoot, talk about missing people. Be an action-packed day. It'll be a lot of fun. So I'm looking for that too. Now let's talk about the movie for a second. In the last, oh, I'd say six months, I've been slowly preparing you, the audience, for this movie. Whether you realized it or not, I have been. And I've been feeding you things that I had learned myself over time and I was trying to acclimate you to the jolt that you'd have when you watch this movie. I've only had one or two comments about the movie that were really negative. Now, that's to me personally. If you go to uh, Amazon and you read a few of those one-star movies, it's like some people really hated the movie. And uh, I don't understand it. But to overcome a one star on Amazon takes 10 10 stars or 10 five stars. It's hard to overcome. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what kind of review you're going to make, but it really helps me and us to have more reviews on a movie. The more reviews, the better. And that way people can go in there and make a decision. But usually everyone goes to Amazon to read reviews. And... Uh, I'd appreciate it if everybody that's listening to this, that's watched the movie, would go write a review about it. So, the movie. Everyone say, Dave, you're saying it's aliens. No, I never said it was aliens in that movie. There's a lot of things in that movie that you have to be a thinking person to understand. First thing in the movie, what did the Air Force Base tell one of the witnesses of that triangular UFO when they called? Remember that. It's a key point. What the Air Force Base told them. Now, there's been somebody named Richard Doty, D-O-T-Y, that said some things that our government has been abducting people for years. I don't know if it's true. I don't know Mr. Doty. But supposedly we have some very far-reaching technology 
And he's claimed that they've used it, our government has used it to abduct people. And he said it to uh, Dr. Greer on one of his podcasts. I find it interesting because in truth, there's no way to tell who may be taking these people, whether it's our government, whether it's aliens, whether it's other dimensions. But our government has a long history of doing bad things to us, forcibly making us take drugs and test drugs without telling us and driving around a city and spraying drugs in the neighborhood. Yeah, it's been happened. It's happened. I'm not telling you anything that's not a fact, but in the early 60s, there's a lot of tests done on citizens without them knowing. So, when you watch Missing 411, the UFO connection, I didn't say the alien connection. UFO, you see something in the sky and you don't know what it is or where it came from, that's a UFO. Now, it may turn out to be a Cessna 150 that belongs to the local airport. But at the time you saw it, it was a UFO. UFO has many generic terms. And the title was chosen specifically because of this. I'm somebody who never makes reckless claims. And this story has many twists and turns to it that you need to understand. So when you watch it, you watch it and you listen carefully. And like I've stated, the most common comment is that I had to watch it two or three times because there was so much content. Exactly. Now, it's about the movie. I'm very proud of it, by the way. And it's something that took three years more money than I ever believed I'd have and beg, borrow, and steal to get this movie done. And uh, it's, very, it's a very nerve-wracking period in my life right now, admittedly. So, let's get to the letters. Hey, Dave. I uh, wanted to send you this. It's from CBC News in Canada, December 27th, 2022. On the front lines of the fight against zombie deer disease in Manitoba. Ooh. Hey, wait a minute. It's chronic wasting disease. And that was in your movie. And it's something I've talked to you about for months before this movie came out. A decades-long fear came true for hunter and veterinarian Erica Ansu in November of last year. Chronic wasting disease had been detected in Manitoba for the first time. The devastating disease was first detected in Canada in the mid-1990s, around the time she graduated from vet school with a master's degree in medical microbiology, and she's been following it ever since. Fortunately, in Manitoba, we only had our first case last year. I was very angry when it happened, she said, who lives in Gross Isle, Ma Gross Isle Manitoba, and works in Winnipeg. The disease was first found in Manitoba in a mule deer in October 2021, near the Saskatchewan border. Another case was announced a few weeks later. Let me stop there. <clears throat> if one deer or two deer are found to have the disease near the border, you take a pen and a ruler and you draw a 200 mile radius around that point and it's a guarantee that's how far at least it has traveled. As a result, the province ordered a deer call to control the spread of the disease last December. <coughs> Excuse me. In late August, the disease had been confirmed in a total of five mule deer in western Manitoba. Chronic wasting disease can affect the brain and nervous system of members of the cervid or deer family, including white-tailed deer, mule deer, moose, and elk. The disease, which is always fatal to those animals, spreads easily through saliva, urine, feces, tissue, and even through plants and soil. An animal can be infected with CWD for up to three years before showing signs of the disease. 
key point. Animal doesn't show any signs of the disease. It's urinating all over the grass. Next year comes along, eats the grass, catches the disease. See the cycle? Prions are never killed in the wild. They live essentially forever. So, could be in that soil forever. So how many deer are going to come by in the next 10 years and catch the disease that that other deer that looked normal had? You get it? This is huge, folks. Huge. How do you stop it? I don't know if you can. That is, that is the possible issue. The disease, which is always fatal to those animals, spreads easily, like I said. Large stage symptoms include excessive drooling, salivating and urinating, and leave the animals unable to hold their heads up, giving them an almost zombie-like appearance, which has led to CWD, sometimes being referred to as a zombie deer disease. I don't care where you're at in the U.S. You see a deer like that, you keep your eye on them and call Fish and Game or call the sheriff right away. And what they're going to do is they're going to come and kill that animal because it's going to infect everything in that area. Since it was first detected in Canada in 96 on an elk in a farm in Saskatchewan, it has spread among wild deer populations in Alberta and now Manitoba, which signals to Ansu, the vet, that the province could be on the brink of a serious problem. Read my lips. That province is under a huge problem right now. It's something we need to pay a lot of attention to, she said. The disease belongs to the transmissible spongiform encephalopoly, or TSE, family, and is similar to mad cow disease. Ansel was the president of the Manitoba Vet Medical Association during the mad cow disease crisis in 2003. We were lucky we nipped it in the bud that when we did. Transmissibility to humans? Although there is no evidence of transmission of the disease to humans, Health Canada recommends not eating meat from an infected animal. However, some researchers believe the disease, like mad cow disease, could be spread to humans, Manitoba government wildlife biologist Richard Davis said. If you know anyone, anyone that's a deer hunter, elk hunter, moose hunter, and they're in a state or province that has chronic wasting disease, they are 100% full to eat that meat without it being tested. Every state that has CWD in it tests that animal for free. I can't emphasize enough how important this is. I've said it for the last two years. Everything I've said has been validated right there in that article. And I would hope that every hunter has some loved one that can knock them on the shoulder and say, hey, did you get that tested? It's the biggest wildlife disaster in our lifetime, for sure. Hey, Dave, I wish to address only one issue, the concept of getting over a life-shattering event. We as human beings are meant to have all kinds of experiences here in a dualistic world. Where there is a yin, there is a yang. The good, the bad. I believe that our experiences are meant for the growth of our souls. And I say this because of Hinduism, as in other belief systems, the soul is eternal. And it is what matters most of our, in our existence. We are not meant to get over any experience we have, whether it be blissful or horrific. Without the bad, we would never know the good. Without the sadness, we would never know the goodness. The contrast of these states of being is required. If it were so simple that we could get over anything, then what is the point of life? How would our spirit or our soul grow? Assuming that it was our choice to come here, it had to be for a reason. It is said that a planet Earth is the most difficult place in the universe to live. Read that again. It is said that the planet Earth is the most difficult place in the universe to live. Who says that? Who knows that? How would anyone know that? And that because of this, the soul is put on a fast track to development cycle due to the stark differences we are confronted with. 
energy loss we experience affects us deeply. Unfortunately, some people cannot continue on with life after these events, and that deeply saddens me because we did not come here to know the answers to the questions why such trauma has happened. If we knew that, then there would be no reason to, for us to be here. This brings me back to the soul's journey. And all I can say is that we can simply understand that this life is an education on many levels. Then it is vital that we see it through the very end. And that when we do, we may learn that an apparent end to a loved one is in reality no end at all. Sorry. As someone who's lived the horrific parts of this life, and has seen horrific parts of this life. When I was a policeman, I've seen things that unbelievable. And I did everything I could to just exit out of my mind. And people say, well, Dave, as this person has said, well, Dave, you weren't supposed to forget it. If I thought about Ben actually taking his life in his room, about Ben, the act of doing it the moments before if I thought about that all the time, I'd be a ruined person. It's affected me so catastrophically, I can't even begin to tell you. The only way I can manage to live on is if I push that to the side and think about the great things in the world. A grief counselor told me, Dave, you've lived through one of the hardest things a human can the death of their ch child. And then on top of that, I was going through something else that I've never talked about. And I won't talk about it. But it was equally as bad. And to think that this is something that we're supposed to experience and in the end it's good, Sorry, I don't see it. I'll never see it. Next letter. Dear Dave, thanks for all your work. I'm watching the UFO connection, Missing 411, the UFO connection for the second time. It is very well done and very interesting. There are obviously a lot of questions about what happened to these people, but I wonder why there were three gunshots and the dogs being in the camp with Ray Salmon case. The three gunshots would indicate that Ray was lost, but why were the dogs locked in the camper? Why were the dogs not with him? The entire case is very strange, which is why it's in the movie. Yeah, his, Ray's wife couldn't even explain why the dogs were in the camper. I'm just curious. We moved to a very rural area in the northern lower peninsula of Michigan in August of this past year, and there were very strange things taking place on the property within the first couple of months. We have about 10 and a half acres. About half of it is wooded, and the back end of the property abuts up to a creek. At the time, the adjacent properties on both sides of ours and across the road were vacant, and our property had been vacant for I don't know how long before we moved in. One place was used as a summer cabin, but I don't know when the last time anyone had been there. Our very first night there after moving in, my wife and I were talking in the living room when she heard a very loud noise outside. She said it sounded like a door slamming or something whacking the side of the garage. The house sits up on a hill and the garage is a couple hundred feet from the house at the bottom of the hill. So we went down there to check out the motion light on the house was on when we went outside but the motion light on the garage was not. We shined our flashlight around, but didn't see anything. A few nights later, my wife and my daughter and I were again talking in the living room. I walked into the kitchen and was standing near the open window when we heard a loud crash right outside the front yard. The front yard is wooded and the noise sounded like a tree being broken and pushed over. We would hear what sounded like wood knocks constantly. One of our first nights there, I woke up at 2 a.m. and listened to wood knocks coming from the backwoods until daylight when it stopped. When it was light enough outside, I watched out the window to see if I could see anything. Never did. I worked from home part of the time. One day we kept hearing the knocks out by the barn, out back. So I grabbed my pistol and walked out there. I leaned against a tree and just waited, watched, and listened. A friend had told us that the knocking sound that we were hearing were acorns falling on the metal roof of the barn. 
So I stood there hoping to see or hear the noise that I could verify that that was the acorns. But the noises did not occur while, occur while I was out there. We did not hear the sound again that day. The acorns falling on the roof seemed logical, but the sounds were too orchestrated. When we first heard it happening throughout the night, we entertained the idea that someone was out there whacking trees all night long. But that didn't make any sense. The way the sound stopped at daylight that one night and the way they stopped when I went out with my pistol, along with the crashing sounds outside the house, just seemed too strange to be acorns. I've never heard the tree knock sounds coming from the property across the road when I was down at the garage. There's a metal barn over there, so I suppose it could have been acorns, but again, again it all just seems too strange when adding it all together. I searched online to see if any wildlife makes a sound like that. The only thing that came up were woodpeckers and Bigfoot. I knew it wasn't woodpeckers. When we would sit out by the fire, we would half jokingly say that when it got dark, the critters would come out any time now because every night we would hear strange sounds. We were joking, but it was creepy. And we did not like being out there at night. My daughter would go back to the creek during the day because she was working on building a dock. I'm surprised she would go all in with me and the noises we heard, but she did not have a job yet and was bored. I was always worried about her and told her to be aware of what was going on. She was home alone one day and while in her bedroom, she heard something bang on the living room window. She also heard something walking around outside the house at night. Her bedroom was on the other side of the house than ours and we have a wood porch that she heard something walking on. When this was all started, I began praying that the earth and everything in it belongs to God. He created everything and everything belongs to him. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. He has authority all over man and darkness and heavenly beings. He is Lord of all. I don't know if this is why, but we have not heard the strange noises since. I've spent a lot of time in the woods hunting and hiking and I have a lot of time cutting wood in the barn. I've not seen or heard anything strange like we were hearing. I've not encountered any tracks, even in the snow. Things seem to be normal now, and I don't mind being outside at night anymore, although I stay aware and carry my side arm when I'm working outside or going out back. My wife and kids don't venture outside too much right now because of winter. My theory is that whatever we were hearing was spiritually related and that they submitted to God's authority and left the area. I'd appreciate hearing any ideas you or your sources might have about this or if you have encountered any other stories like this. Thanks again for your work. I hope you have a great year. P.S. I also had a strange experience not too far from here while camping a couple years ago. Maybe I'll share that. So let me say something about this. I've heard a lot of stories in my life about strange things in the woods, about strange things around ranches and farms. And you know, almost all of them emanated from an area that was left vacant for years. And then sudden some, somebody moves in and whoever was spiritually occupying that area or physically occupying didn't like it. And they let the people know what it is. I have no idea, but this person is much braver than I am. I don't know if I would have the gumption to leave my family there and Wait them out. A lot of things that you can do that people have told me about putting precious stones around the perimeter of your house, uh, burning certain herbs in the house, etc. Thanks, letter. Hey, Dave. I'll do my best to keep this short as possible, but apologize in advance if it gets long. I've been debating for a while whether I should email you about a weird experience I had as a night shift operator, but when you made a comment in a recent missing persons edition, I decided to share my story. But first, I have to say I was blown away by your missing 411 UFO connection. Well done. I, like many others, have watched it more than once. I left a review on Amazon, too. Thank you, sir. You said that the special effects were expensive, ungodly expensive. But I think it was worth the cost of portraying the things people saw when they didn't necessarily explain them. Really, how do you explain a silent floating triangle with tic-tac shaped white and red beams underneath? In my mind's eye would not have come up with the image the special effects showed. So anyway, onto my weird patrol experience. 
I was a full-time cop working midnight shift in a medium-sized suburban agency. It was winter in the suburb north of Chicago, maybe end of 2017, beginning 2018. We got a hot call somewhere around 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. for a missing woman who was possibly suicidal. The initial information we received made it seem like the woman had left her home just moments prior to our arrival and was still on foot in the area. Naturally, an entire board night shift flooded the area to save the day. We were searching on foot in a typical suburban neighborhood. When we didn't find the lady after a good half hour of canvassing, we wound up grouped together at a T intersection, the south side of the road, and in a wooded area with a small creek running through it. I included a map image to give you an idea of the small creek and the image where the drainage area of the waterway of an actual creek. You can see the whole neighborhood is also next to the Fox River. The red mark shows where four or five cops were standing. So you can see the red dot right there. Here's the woods. There's the river over here. I was facing south and the other cops were facing north and east. Now, right about when all of us were about to clear the call because we didn't find this missing woman, a motion to my left, west, behind most of the cops caught my attention. I turned to look and imagined my surprise when I saw a naked woman about five feet tall, slim, with long light brown hair. She was maybe eight to ten yards from me. The woman saw me look at her and was completely surprised too. She froze looked straight at me, then bolted into that wooded area, which was approximately 25 yards south from where we were. Of course, I immediately called out to my partners, there, she's right there, she's naked. But by the time they looked, she was completely gone through the matter of seconds. There were some light crunching and rustling sounds in that wooded area, but now that I look back and think about it, the sounds weren't half as loud as you'd expect if a small frame human were running from the cops. My partner took off after the woman and even went into the wooded space which he couldn't move through quickly, quietly, or easily. But he sure as hell crunched around in there looking for the woman I saw. He called over the radio that he heard something moving around in there too, but didn't see anything. Now, weirdly, I didn't go in after her. I wasn't frozen or scared, but I just didn't. I can't say why. Eventually, he came back out in quite a few minutes of being in there. He asked me if I was sure I saw a person, and I said I was. I know even today, Dave, I saw a woman, or well, something. Well, anyway, my partners clearly didn't believe me. Not wanting to seem crazy myself, I didn't insist any longer. One of my partners graciously, graciously offered me a way to save a face by saying, it was probably a deer. I replied, yeah, it must have been. Except I know it wasn't. The woman or thing I saw, all the same color, which was like pale white skin, which is probably why I initially thought she was naked. She, it had hair that made me think of a female because it was long past her shoulders. Again, like a woman's head of hair and also pale to her skin. She had two arms, two legs and a head, two legs and a head just like any normal human. She had a face that I describe as neither pretty nor ugly. I don't recall seeing breasts, nipples, etc. The hair was hanging loose and fell in front of her shoulders and behind, so maybe her breasts were covered by the hair. In any case, turns out the missing woman we were trying to find had decided to live it up in Chicago for the night without her husband's knowledge. Also, we later found out that she had been gone for three hours by the time officers were notified. So this was never actually a hot call, and there never really was anyone but us in that area. Now, one other thing is worth mentioning. The agency I was working for required officers to at least one foot patrol per shift, preferably in a neighborhood if weather permitted, even on a midnight shift. When this and my patrol area, we rotated areas, I do a foot patrol just north of the wooded area within walking distance. I circled my foot patrol spot in yellow on the screen grab and the red mark where I saw the woman. It's probably a half mile from street to the real area. Dave, I tell you, there were numerous nights I had an overwhelming sensation I was being watched. Oftentimes it was strong enough feeling that I had to fight the urge to run back to the car. It was such a compelling feeling, I usually wanted to sprint, but I didn't. Because that's tough. Because what tough cop would run back to their squad car early in the morning hours? Usually I'd do my foot patrol between 1 and 3 a.m. 
because of a feeling of being watched in the middle of the relatively nice and quiet suburban neighborhood. I'd ignore the feeling, finish the stupid foot patrol, but be glad as heck to leave the area when I was done. Always breathing a sigh of relief. I'm sorry, this got way longer than I intended. Wrapping this email up, for whatever reason, the word sprite comes to mind to define the naked woman. But I have no idea if that's accurate as I know nothing about the mythology. I finally decided to tell you my story after hearing from the multiple experts you've cited and interviewed that strong evidence exists to show portals exist. I wonder if that woman sprite being didn't think she'd exit a portal in a quiet neighborhood at 2 a.m. in the winter and see four or five cops standing there. Perhaps she got away so quickly because she used another portal to escape. Thanks for your work. Your voice for the missing holds a measurable value. You have kindness and compassion in your heart that comes through in all your work. It must be emotionally exhausting. But please draw the strength of your village and villagers when you feel overwhelmed. Thank you. That's quite an interesting note for many reasons. Letter. My name is Matt, and I'm a big fan of your research books, films, and most of your characters as a genuine and compassionate human being. Two nights ago, my wife showed me this new open source. All that is called is chat GT GPT. What it does is ask you about literally anything you can think of, and it will give you a perfectly grammar spelled checked report on a matter of what you're thinking about. It can put it into formats. I only tried it a few times, but there was something disturbing I noticed. I asked, what information do you have about missing 411? It immediately spit out, this is a subject matter by David Politis and has sold many books and is a successful writer. It then kept going and said something along the lines of calling your theories into question. Only a member of the village and someone who is a critical thinker would realize that only you follow facts and don't present theories. This has greatly annoyed me because of my troubles with Wikipedia trying to get the sources that call you a conspiracy theorist thrown out. This AI just came out and I wanted to make you aware of it, especially because of your connections in the tech field. I'm hoping you can find out the creator. This technology is very new to the public and it will probably become big very soon. Just wanted to give you the knowledge. Anyway, have a few year, have a good New Year's, Dave. I hope you and Angie are well. Thanks for that. A couple of things. I had some huge, huge interviews lined up to do on this movie. And you know, both of them got dropped because the hosts read Wikipedia and believed it. And I know many of you said, oh, Dave, don't worry about what's on Wikipedia. If any idiot believes that, then it's not worth. No, it would have been worth. These were some people that had millions and millions of followers. So don't think that, that Wikipedia isn't very powerful. And I know that there's a couple people. I encourage you all to go read Wikipedia. It's a complete lie. 99% of it is a lie. A blatant lie about me and the people get away with it now if there's somebody in this world that's a Wikipedia expert hey be my guest go out there and take them on about it please but for the people out there to say hey oh, don't worry about it no I worry about it every day because it's out now a lie and it does it, they have had an effect on people hearing about missing 411 so when I ask you to go do a review or ask you to have some kind of minor impact on the word getting out about this, it's a big deal because if I can't count on the village to get the word out, then people are gonna to migrate to places where they think it's honest, a place like Wikipedia, which we know is not. So those are the letters for tonight. And now we're on to some very, very interesting missing people cases. There's two of them. First case is a man named Ray Cassidy, 73 years old. And Ray disappeared September 2nd, 2001 on Mount Gray, Southern Island of New Zealand. That's right. 
Let me show you where this happened. This is the Southern Island, Mount Gray. It was located right up in here. It's in a very remote area. You can get to a lot of area in New Zealand that's very remote pretty quick. And remember, New Zealand is an island. The specific place where he was hiking with friends, Mount Gray, right here. It's a national park right here. It's about 10 miles to the ocean from where this place happened. So he went with a group of friends and they were going to hike Mount Gray, which is about 3,064 feet, not a huge mountain. It's a four mile hike to the fire tower from the trailhead. Fire towers on top of the mountain. And it's on the southern island, as I said. The family stated that Ray was a very experienced hiker, in extremely good shape for his age, and he was someone that was quite aware of his surroundings. Ray got about 200 meters ahead of the group he was hiking with with his friends, and they lost sight of him. And they didn't think anything of it. They said in a short while, they're going to come around to Ben and Ray's going to be sitting there. No problem. Well, they hiked and hiked and hiked and turned around, made it back to the trailhead, waited. Ray never came back. So they called authorities. The formal search for Ray Cassidy lasted, the formal and informal search lasted several weeks. His friends, neighbors, etc., came and searched. And they used airplanes, helicopters, canines, on and on and on. His son, Steve, said his father is probably one of the most unlikely people to ever get lost there. Hmm. Now, every once in a while, I'll read comments that are made by searchers. And most of the time, searchers don't make many good comments. They're very quiet. They don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want anyone to think they're odd, and they want to keep their job as a search and rescue coordinator or manager. But let me read you some of these comments because they blew my mind. One of them said he was seen one minute and gone the next. Next sentence. He just completely vanished off the face of the earth. I've been involved in search and rescue for 50 years and every now and again, one of these cases pop up when you're completely baffled because there's no logical explanation for it. Did you read that? Let me do it again. He just completely vanished off the face of the earth. I've been involved in search and rescue for 50 years, and every now and again, one of these cases pop up when you're completely baffled because there's no logical explanation for it. <laughs> but it only got better. Another search and rescue member said this. It was just as though someone had come down from above and zapped him into a flying saucer. For three months after this formal search, I kept going up there on my day offs and weekends. Nothing was ever found. Zapped him into a flying saucer. Search and rescue members said that. And remember, this is 2001. Do these statements ring possibly true today? I think so, friends. But let me explain to you a couple things. First of all, this is what the woods look like around the Mount Gray Trail. It goes off to the side right here. But 
big big trees lots of cover when you get up high there's only little shrubbery but the trail up to it is about four miles one way it's not a hard trail not any place to hide and in the subsequent months they brought cadaver dogs in there and cadaver dog could smell a body miles away they never picked up any scent now the real interesting part of this is i would probably say one in every 400 300 cases that i've seriously researched Will I ever find a comment that I found on this case? Again, the coordinators and the search people are very reluctant to talk. They probably all think this way, but they don't want to say it. But it makes you think. When they say there's no logical explanation of what happened to Ray Cassidy, then what the heck happened to him? Did something similar happen to him that happened to the hunter in this movie? Makes you wonder. And there's many other cases on New Zealand that I've written about. It's an island. It's got some very remote locations. I'll just leave it at that. Go on to another case. The other case involves a man named Keith Haggard, 55 years old. Disappeared April 24th, 1987 in the Pecos Wilderness. Oh, the Pecos Wilderness. In that general area, I've written about 10 cases of people that have disappeared. When he was younger, Keith <coughs> graduated from Portland State University with a geology degree. And he went up to the Northwest Territories to be a geologist and a prospector. Homework assignment, write this down. The CIRQ, C-I-R-Q-U-E, of the unclimbables. The CIRQ of the unclimbables. A friend of mine, in fact, it was, it was my employer when I was working for this company in Canada, he owned a lodge in the Yukon Territory. And in that lodge, he had three airplanes and a helicopter, and he was probably the best pilot I've ever met, Warren Lefebvre. And Warren one day said, hey, Dave, how about if I take you and the kids into the Cirque, and uh, I want to show you something. I said, great. So we fly through the Yukon Territory into uh, the Northwest Territories, and we landed at this place called the Cirque. Unbelievable. If you've been to Yos Yosemite, it kind of reminds you of that. Granite walls completely surround you. When we landed, we walked over to this area and there's little, little animals everywhere. It's like you're in Disneyland because nobody's, nothing's afraid of you. And uh, Warren had built a composite toilet in there for the climbers and we were in there just doing some work on it and uh, I was happy to help him. It's a day I'll never forget. It was one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in my life. But that entire ride into there, <laughs> Warren had told me, Dave, this is really remote out here. Not many people come in. He flies people into this area to do some climbing on the granite. And he goes, hey, while we're here, you might hear something that scares you, but don't worry. About an hour later, all of a sudden, a giant piece of granite f falls off the side of one of these huge mountains out in the distance. And it made a very loud clacking sound. And there's still snow in the area. So the expansion and contraction of the ice and the water and the rocks, these things were falling all the time. It was pretty, pretty amazing. But Keith Haggard worked in this area as a geologist and later in life he became interested in solar energy and became the director of the new mexico solar energy association 
and he was the assistant director and communications chief for the Energy Institute in Golden, Colorado. Oh, Golden, Colorado, where I'm going to be the 12th of January. He's described his friends as someone with no ego at all and described as being one of the nicest men you could ever meet. And he was a part-time professor at uh, College of Santa Fe, and he was a resident of Santa Fe, New Mexico. So, I've been to this place many times, Santa Fe. This is the Santa Fe ski area. And this is the Holy Ghost campground where Keith went to, to go hiking. All this area, many people have disappeared. Very, very, very strange place. The ride from Santa Fe up to the ski resort, worth taking. Very pretty. But a lot of elk in this area, a lot of elk hunters, and I've written about elk hunters who have disappeared here and never been found. Catch my drift. So Keith was not not only a smart guy, he was also a very athletic guy for 55. He loved the outdoors and he had hiked the trail that he chose on the Holy Ghost. Kind of, kind of an interesting name to be taking a hike on, the Holy Ghost Trailhead. Hmm. Well, on April 24th, 87, Keith left his Santa Fe residence and drove his 1980 Volvo to the Holy Ghost campground in the Santa Fe wilderness. Arrived about 1 p.m. Got out a canteen, walking stick, kept his wallet in his pants, and he took off. He told his wife that he'd be back that night. Well, at 11 o'clock that night, his wife, Ruth, called the police because he, he wasn't back. A couple hours later, the sheriff found the Volvo at the trailhead, exactly where he said he had told his wife he'd be. Well, the search area was southwest of a place called Cowles, and it was near a creek. And it was an unlikely place because it was right next to water. Nobody ever thought that Keith would be lost next to water, so close to a campground. Well, two days later, at 2.15 p.m., a search team found Keith's body in a creek, face up, Hmm. The body had bruises on it. Interesting. The coroner said that the circumstances surrounding this case are suspicious. He was found with no hiking boots on, no canteen, and he's located just 1.5 miles from the campground. Four days after the autopsy was made, the coroner came out and stated that he died of exposure to the elements. He didn't drown. Temps during the day were in the 70s and at the 30s at night. So I implore upon you to think about this. He's found in a slow moving creek, face up, 1.5 miles away from his car. He'd hiked this many times. The trail was right next to the creek. He knew exactly where he was. Why would he take his boots off? Hikers don't do that. Why would he die from hypothermia when he was so close to the car he could almost run to it in 20 minutes? Now, everybody would think right away, oh, he drowned. But he didn't. He was floating face up. Highly, highly, highly unusual for a man. Men drown face down in water. Nobody really knows why. It has something to do with their body makeup compared to women. But in the cases I write about, Many of the men are found face up. Now there's 10 disappearances approximately in this cluster area. Many of them are drownings that are missing clothing and shoes and personal effects. Now the coroner stated that 
The case is unusual because of the circumstances surrounding it. And I'm sure that he meant lack of shoes, face up, in water, and he had bruises. There was never an explanation about the bruises. Now, maybe he fell down a hillside into the creek. Let's think about that for a second. So you're up above, you're looking down at the water, you slip, you fall into the creek. Now, there was nothing like a fractured skull, concussion, no. See, it wasn't knocked out. So you fall into a creek, what are you going to do? You're going to get out. Because Ray was only going to take a short hike and probably be off, off that mountain by 5 or 6 o'clock. But you're in the water. You fell in it. You're not debilitated. You're just going to get out. Right? And then, if it was me, and I was cold, I would, since I know where I'm at, since I've hiked this trail before, I'm going to hike pretty fast, or maybe even jog back to the car, turn the heat on, and get the heck back home. I'm not going to lay in the creek, face up, and drown, or die of hypothermia because I stayed in water. But, if I had or was given a large dose of GHB and I was unable to move, then the cause of death would be hypothermia because you would lay there in the cold water, unable to get out, and eventually the hypothermia would kill you. How many times have I told you of this? I told you many times. And in Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence, I outline, I think, 80 cases of something just like this happening. It's not as unusual as you might think. Now, the medical examiner didn't test the body for GHB because it's not one of the 24 standard tests that are ran on dead bodies looking for drugs. It should be, but it's not. And each one of the drugs that are tested for costs the county or the state more money because the lab has to use more ingredients to test. So they have to cap it somewhere. I understand that. But GHB, G like George, H as in Henry, B as in boy, is a really, really important aspect in many of these cases where bodies are found in the water coroners and physicians, you should definitely argue hard that this should be added to that 24 count drug test. I hope, I hope Keith rests in peace and I hope someday Ray's family can find him. Lately there's been a lot of really interesting comments on my Twitter page. David Politis at Can Am Missing. Uh, if you go there, I post almost daily something, and uh, there's a lot of good discussion about it. And uh, there's been a lot of things on there about uh, cattle mutilations in Oregon, and uh, a lot of interesting things about my work. So check it out. Lastly, I want to say, do not, do not purchase any of my books from any other online source other than me. I've said it a lot, but I know many people aren't listening. You're going to pay three and four times the value of the book if you go to Amazon, eBay, etc. Go to our website, NA, like North America, BigfootSearch.com, NA, BigfootSearch.com. Go to the store. You can see all of our books there, $24.99. A couple of them are $29.99 because they're so big, but you'll get the hint. You don't want to pay hundred, hundred and fifty dollars for a book that you can get from me for twenty-four ninety-nine. Yeah, there's a lot of resellers ripping you off. And they they hide their identity and pretend there's somebody who just wants to read the book and then they turn around and sell it. So just so you know, buy from us. In the meantime, 
do something kind and friendly for your neighbors. Right now, uh, nonprofits, this is one of their slowest months because everyone's usually donated in December. This is one of the months where they really need the help. And I know that there's a lot of people right now that are going to rescue missions and homes to get meals. And uh, any donation you can make to one of those homes in your community would be greatly appreciated. Even volunteering your time, you're going to find, if you do that, how rewarding it is to your soul. So, I appreciate you being here. Uh, make sure you subscribe to our channel. Thanks. See you soon. Politis out. <laughs>